This week on Quality Digest Live, corporate short-termism. Is your company under-investing in its future? Well, we'll find out when we come back. Back to Quality Digest Live. QDL is your weekly look at who and what is making news in the world of quality. I'm Dirk Ducharme, Editor-in-Chief of Quality Digest. Today we're going to be talking about short-termism and how to fix it. Short-termism is when a company is more focused on short-term results rather than investing to meet long-term goals. And this is usually in terms, uh, we think about this in, in, normally in terms of maybe financial gains, but really it can encompass almost any aspect of the business. Sometimes in the pressure to uh, show uh, results, uh, financial production, quality improvements or whatever, we look for quick fixes rather than long-term strategies. And while these might look great and give stakeholders instant gratification, they may undermine what a company is trying to accomplish in the long term. So here to talk to us today about short-termism is Greg Milano, founder and chief executive officer of Fortuna Advisors. He is a leading expert expert in capital allocation, behavioral finance, and incentive compensation design, and also author of, appropriately enough, Curing Corporate Short-Termism, Future Growth Versus Current Earnings. Greg, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me on, Dirk. Hey, no problem. So um, before we get started, why don't you just tell us really quickly about uh, what you do and what Fortuna does. We are a strategy firm, Fortuna Advisors, and, and what we do is we help companies to think about uh, you know, where they should be investing, how they should be allocating resources across the company, how they should be measuring performance to know if they've created value or not. And, and we even dabble in helping companies design better incentive plans so that people are, are actually paid for doing the right thing. And, and what is, uh, so, so getting in kind of the, 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 the main topic here, what are some of the main causes of short-termism? I mean, I, I guess short-term thinking, you know, l l looking out for the, the immediate, the instant gratification. And is that more common now than what you've seen in the past? It seems to be increasing. And I think the common thing that everybody blames it on is quarterly earnings. And, and frankly, quarterly earnings does, does uh, cause a bit of a problem. Uh, people become so focused with guiding what's gonna happen next quarter and then trying to explain why it did or did not happen uh, that they often will do things that sacrifice the long term in order to meet those short term objectives. And that's really the, the sort of starting point of the problem. But it's not the only problem. Uh, we find a lot of times people use measures that look good when you are sort of milking the business, under investing in the business, and tend to perform worse uh, in, through these measures when you're investing in the future. And that also can discourage people from making investments. And so using better measures can be a, you know, a, a benefit. Uh, and lastly, uh, people often measure performance against budgets or plans, which encourages people to plan low. Uh, the technical term is to sandbag the plan. And when you sandbag a plan, you're, you're understating what you think you can accomplish. So whatever you do later looks better when compared to that plan. And there's one thing we're pretty sure of is that when you pay people to plan to be mediocre, they tend to be mediocre. They don't tend to, to strive for the stars as much. So. All of those different forces together encourage people to invest less in the future and focus much more on current performance. And unfortunately, that's uh, happening quite widely across corporate America. Um, so, I mean, you, you, uh, you, you kind of answered part of this next question. I was, I was going to ask you, what harm does short-termism cause? Um, and it sounds like one of the things you just described is mediocrity. I'm going, I'm going, to, I'm going, to, aim, I'm going to aim, deliberately aim low so that I can reach my goal rather than kind of trying to stretch out. But what are some other things that this causes? Maybe you can give us some examples. Well, I mean, when you uh, when companies invest less than their optimal amount in the future, they tend not to be as innovative. They tend not to grow as much. They tend not to be creating as many jobs. They tend not to be improving the the, the features or the quality of their products and services uh, because they're underinvesting. And and that really, you know, depending on what part of underinvestment you're talking about, it has a negative impact on the customers, on the shareholders, on job creation. Uh, so this is a pretty far-reaching problem with, with, with significant you know, negative implications. 
And, and what about uh, kind of for, for our audience, a lot of who work in quality improvement, continuous improvement, does, does corporate short-termism have an impact on, on those departments as well or on those aspects as well? Continuous improvement is a, a really important part of trying to accomplish what I write about in the book. Um, you know, getting away from measuring variances to a plan and instead moving toward measuring absolute improvements uh, is very important. And when you measure continuous improvement, or like I often like to say, cumulative improvement, uh, we get a, a mindset where maybe I'm okay not meeting my short-term goals if I'm making investments that are going to provide or I expect them to provide big payoffs over the longer term. And when I make those investments uh, and I have the willingness to live with the, the current performance maybe being a little lower than it otherwise would be, uh, I can wind up achieving higher levels of, of whatever my goals are in the longer term, and that, that's really beneficial. Okay. Um, you use in your book the, the term underinvestment uh, a lot, and I, I think we understand where you're going with that, but maybe you can explain that a little bit more. So the main uh, types of investment that we think about are things like capital expenditures to build plant and equipment, uh, uh, innovation spending, what shows up as research and development, uh, and other times of sort of creative spending. Uh, brand building, advertising is really important. Employee training is very important. Uh, lots of companies are spending less on employee training right now. Now, some of that lower spending is because of the use of technology. It's more efficient to deliver computer-based training than it used to always have to be class-based training. Uh, but the amount of training oftentimes is, is, is not as much as it should be. And, and so the, the workforce isn't as skilled as they could be. And that has negative implications as well. And when, when, um, when you were, there's something stuck in my mind when you were talking about underinvesting in training. Is this, is this a, a deliberate uh, a deliberate choice. We just don't see training as important, and that's kind of a, 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 a one type of short-termism, just not seeing the long run, the, the value of training in the long run. Or is there something else that's that's driving that? No, I don't think um, I don't think people don't think training is important. Just like I don't think they believe that innovation is unimportant or you know marketing is unimportant. Um, but what happens is you know it's getting near the end of the quarter, and we're falling short of our goals and we have to squeeze something and squeezing something that doesn't hurt us now but may hurt us later is easier than squeezing something that 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 uh you know that will also hurt us right now so uh it's not that people don't think these things are important they just become the easiest things to you know to sort of play around with consciously or unconsciously in order to try and achieve short-term goals and uh it's really unfortunate because um you know when you talk to people about the principles they almost always agree uh, but they also still succumb to the very same problems that I'm talking about. Well, so, so how do you address it? I mean, if, if everybody understands that this is a problem, that we're, we're too short-sighted, um, I mean, people like instant gratification. They like the idea that I'm going, to, I'm going to do something and in the short term I'm going to see a result, whether it's a financial result or whatever. They like that. How do you get people to back away from that and delay that gratification and be able to realize that down the line they're going to uh, they're going to see something and, and I, I think uh, uh, and an example that immediately pop, pops into my mind is uh, 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 Amazon Jeff Bezos I mean Amazon was non profitable I believe for the first twenty years but that was that was a, a, a plan he was building up his infrastructure he was you know building his market and the fact that he was losing money for twenty years. You know, that was just part of the long-term ramifications of, of what was going on. So how do you get people to think like Jeff Bezos? <laughs> well, it's interesting. I mean, it may be hard to get people to think exactly like Jeff Bezos, but moving them in that direction is quite possible. Um, I wouldn't say Amazon was unprofitable for 20 years. Okay. I know the accounting statements say that, but that's because the accounting statements have a significant distortion in them uh, when it comes to measuring this kind of value creation. All of the investments that they make in, in R&D and building their technology and building their capabilities have to get expensed in the current year for accounting purposes. When Walmart built their retail giant, uh, they built store after store after store, and they were investing many years, more than 100% of their profits back into the business. But the way accounting works, they got to consider that an investment on what's called the balance sheet, whereas the kinds of investments that Amazon is making are being expensed on the profit and loss statement. And so they look like they're unprofitable because they're making all these investments. But 
in the framework that I explain in the book, uh, we have a measure called residual cash earnings. And residual cash earnings treats R&D as an investment in the business. And in fact, our measure tracks Amazon's share price quite well you know, over the last 15 or so years. Oh, okay, all right, all right, staying corrected. Um, so, one of the one of the goals it sounds like is to to look at the value to all stakeholders, not just to shareholders, uh, which may may be looking for short term profits. So you're trying to look at what do all the stakeholders, which might be customers, uh, shareholders, everybody involved, uh, suppliers. Um, uh, and that, when you do that, does that kind of force you to think more long term? It does force you to think long term, uh, but I would note that companies that uh, are rated highly on their corporate purpose and on uh, you know how they treat their other stakeholders, their employees, their customers, the environment, uh, you know, the social good, and so forth, uh, companies that are rated highly on that um, and are recognized, for example, in in uh, Forbes Just 100 or in uh, Fortune's Most Admired Companies, those companies also tend to produce better results for shareholders. Uh, I published an article titled, Companies That Do Well Also Do Good, because very often the very companies that are, are focused on having a, a, a better corporate purpose, if you will, also deliver better performance for shareholders. Now that could be for one of two reasons, either being very successful gives you the funds to be able to be a good corporate citizen or being a good corporate citizen is good for business. People like to buy products from companies that have a good corporate purpose. I suspect that some of both. I would suspect that it's good for business, uh, but also, you know, companies that are more profitable have the have the ability to to make investments in the in the community and in the, in the society that less profitable companies wouldn't. Uh, so the two really do go hand in hand. Uh, and we do believe that our our uh, longer term uh, approach to thinking about strategy and, and, and investment in a, in a business will uh, will typically lead to more jobs over time and typically lead to more output as far as you know goods for society so I, I think it, you know it, it, we are trying to create a, a pretty symbiotic uh, relationship is is there a way to incentivize this I mean can, can uh, corporate incentive programs and so forth help? contribute to a longer term view rather than a shorter term view or, or maybe distract from a longer term view, you know, do the opposite thing. Yeah, I mean, a typical um, incentive plan, um, despite the best of intentions, I mean, the people that design incentive plans aren't trying to do this, but the typical plan uh, does encourage shorter term thinking than we would like. Uh, and in chapter 14 of the book, uh, I actually describe in quite a bit of detail a better methodology for uh, for establishing incentive compensation. Uh, it starts with using better measures like the one I mentioned before that uh, even tracks value creation at Amazon. And then uh, getting away from the practice of measuring performance against plans. Again, we want to get away from people sandbagging their plan and moving toward continuous improvement, always measuring against the last year. When, you know, when the performance measure does better, it's good. And when it goes down, it's bad. Um, and when you do that, and you get more of what we call an ownership culture. You know, owners are very driven to, 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 to provide performance, strong performance in their business, but they would never try to accomplish this year's goals by sacrificing the future, right? If, if, uh, if something bad happens in the business, say a commodity price rises and input cost goes up and therefore your profits are going to go down, you know, they wouldn't cut R&D. They wouldn't cut advertising because of that, that, that shortfall. But unfortunately, we see that quite often. And in, in the incentive plan that's described in the book gets people to balance the short and long term much better, uh, hopefully, so that they'll they'll behave much more like a long term committed owner. And and what would a, what, what's an example of an incentive program that would that would do that? Okay, so this measure residual cash earnings that I mentioned that tracks Amazon's uh, share price. When that measure is, stays constant from year to year, that means all the new investments in the business are covering their required return on capital, the expected return. And so that's what we call acceptable performance. There's no improvement. It's just a means of producing enough growth in cash flow or profit to be able to earn an adequate return on the new investments that we've made. And then when, you, when, when the measure goes up, that means you've earned more profit than you need in order to, to cover that required return on investment. You get paid more. And when the measure goes down, you would get paid less. Now, the, the key to this is because we're not renegotiating targets every year, 
a manager can think about, well, if I make an investment that's going to weigh on my residual cash earnings this year and my bonus is going to go down, that's unfortunate. But if my forecast for this investment is right and in year two or three or four, there's a bounce back in performance, I'm, I know definitively I'm going to get paid for it then. So just like an owner, I'm faced with the decision of am I willing to give up a little bit of money now to get more money later if my forecast is right? And it really validates that the, the manager has to say, do I really believe my forecast? Do I really believe in what I'm doing? In most companies, capital is free. Uh, they just measure profits and, and it's a real problem and incentive of compensation. We put a cost on capital so we can say to people, use as much of it as you want, invest as much in the business as you want, as long as you believe the investments are gonna be successful. And that's really getting them to think a lot more like the way with long-term committed owners think. Okay, and what is, uh, finally, what is kind of the, the, the key takeaway that you would somebody, somebody reading your, your, your book, um, what is the key takeaway that you would want them to, to get from that? Well, I guess uh, there are many takeaways, but at, at the highest level, um, many people think that companies should behave with more of a long-term mindset. But just asking people to do that it doesn't really change their behavior. If we're paying them to think short term and we're measuring them with measures that respond better to short term performance uh, and we have such a heightened focus on quarterly earnings and so forth, we're going to get the behavior that we get. Uh, and if you want to change behavior, you need to change the measures that are used, the way people set goals, the way they plan, the way they allocate resources, the way they're measured and the way they're paid. And the book is essentially you know, a, a, a guideline on how to actually um, change all of those different processes so that people have the actual tools and the mindset to be able to do you know, what we want them to do. It's not a matter of just saying act differently. It's a matter of changing the processes so they have a chance of achieving. All right. Well, Greg Milano, author of Curing Corporate Short-Termism, Future Growth Versus Current Earnings. Thanks for joining us today. Appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me on. Okay, no problem. And uh, we have a link to uh, Greg's book just below the player down there. So click on that and that will take you out to, uh, take you out to Amazon, I believe, so that you can uh, order that book. Uh, that is it for today's Quality Digest Live. And as usual, if you have some ideas of who or what you would like to see on the show, just send those to us at qdl at qualitydigest.com and we will try to bring those people or things onto the show. Thanks for joining us today. We will see you next week. So long.